title for this session is Can Democracy Survive Big Data and in Elections? Tough question to answer, I think. And we have a good team here um, to try to tackle some of that. So as moderator with Anna Fielder, who is Senior Policy Advisor for the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. Next to me, we have Michael McEvoy, who is Deputy Commissioner for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner um, in British Columbia, so in Canada, but he's currently seconded to the ICO, so essentially the equivalent in the UK. And we'll, s we'll probably hear why. Uh, we, next to him, we have Jeff Chester, Executive Director at the Center for Digital Democracy. Um, it's the first time I meet Jeff, but we've been talking quite a lot over the past two years about all these topics. And then we have Juhi uh, Kurshwesta, thank you. So he's a PhD research researcher at the Max Planck Institute. Um, her research is focused on how users consume information on social networks, obviously. Very good choice of thesis topic. And last on the panel, we have Irina Vesilio, who is assistant to the Director General at the DG Justice, so at the EU Commission. And she was also team leader um, uh, on GDPR at the DG Justice. So what should, be the, what should this session be about? So I think a lot of you might have heard about the use of profiling techniques in different elections and referenda that took place over the past year or two. So that will be the main focus here. Profiling, but also psychometric targeting. Maybe a little bit about the science um, behind this, uh, whether it's to be uh, considered as effective or not, all those techniques. What do we know about it? What do, you, what do we know about the individual effect on a person but also something that's o often overlooked is what is the influence of this targeting on the algorithmic systems that we use? So how much does Facebook, for instance, amplify this targeting and how much of that can be tested in the lab by academics? So that's easy to overlook. Also, what constitutes collusion um, in this context between all the different players? You know, if you interact around data, is this really a collaboration between different actors in a campaign? I think that's a, a question we don't really know how to answer, but um, we can try here. Now, on the targeting at individual level, um, what is the effect of all those techniques on public debates? How does it change the expectations of individuals on how politicians talk to them, how they approach, how they try to convince them? Um, really, how does this change the debate? And we'll see that some do not see a problem at all around these techniques. Some others are horrified. So where is exactly the 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 different mindset around this what's what's making people see this very differently so i must say um so m my background is a mathematician so i'm i'm just a citizen for this a citizen who is very curious and got really involved over the past year or two um, starting in december 2015 actually um looking at one company in particular cambridge analytica and trying to get reporters first to talk about this because I thought it was important in the context of all the elections taking place. Um, so if I can just say my little perspective on all this. Um, the first thing is that it has been really a, a job to convince journalists to change their mindset on how they were covering, uh, I mean not fully change, but at least explore another aspect, which is not just campaign finance as they are used to investigate elections, but also to start following the data, not just following the money following the data around all this. And that took a lot of time to convince them to that this was worthwhile looking at. And actually it took a lot of time to convince also the regulators that this was worth looking at. Um, and now we see that there are several investigations that are following those lines in the UK, in the US, um, in many other countries where the question is really, did different parts of a campaign and electoral operation collaborate or not? Did they exchange money? Did they exchange data? Did they exchange targeting information? So that's really a new set of questions that regulators are not necessarily able to approach right now um, or enforcers. And one last point is that I think in all those topics, it's really important not to focus, not to lose focus that this is about elections. So it's about individual decisions. 
And so that means that the solution should also include a component that is individual, around empowering individuals. So one last thing I want to mention in this context is that there are lawsuits that are being built around this um, in the UK concerning targeting of US citizens. That's another aspect is the, the international data flows around all of this that offer a fantastic opportunity, I find, for, for transparency around the use of data. So that was my little intro. So without losing any more time, I'll pass it on to the moderator, Anna. Thank you. That was a great intro. Thank you very much, Paul. And welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to tell you, we've got a fantastic panel here, but you must have noticed that we don't have any anybody from the actual industry. And this wasn't for the lack of trying. Um, I tried very hard. I invited several companies. Um, at one point, we had Facebook on the panel, but unfortunately, they had to drop out due to personal domestic things. So we thought, well, no panel is complete without all the views. So we just want to show you a little video because um, the, the companies are all over YouTube and they actually tell us what they do. So we'll play this first to put some context in and then we'll, we'll start our discussion. So Paul, can you please play the Today video? we don't need to guess. Yeah, so this is filmed at the Concordia Summit in New York um, in September 2016. So just my personal uh, information. In the background, I was working with journalists to report on all this. I was watching this more or less live. And we're like, oh, he's just saying everything we have been uncovering. And that's great. <laughs> so he's the, he's the CEO. He is the CEO of Cambridge Analytica. Right, with Brexit, played a role in Brexit as a Trump campaign. Today, we don't need to guess at what creative solution may or may not work. We can use hundreds or thousands of individual data points on our target audiences to understand exactly which messages are going to appeal to which audiences way before the creative process starts. So what is big data? Big data is really the aggregation of as many individual data points that you can possibly get your hands on, which are then uh, synthesized in one database of record, cleaned or hygiened, and then used to inform um, and create insight on your target audience. This could include demographic and geographic factors, age, gender, ethnicity, religion, and so forth. Or psychographic or attitudinal factors. This is uh, consumer and lifestyle habits, what car you drive, uh, what products you purchase in shops, what magazines you read, what golf clubs you belong to, uh, what churches you attend. And of course, personality or behavioral data. This is what we talked about earlier, how you see the world, what actually drives you. Okay, yeah. You want to take, you want to take this slide? You want to take that one slide? Yeah, here you go. Yeah, so I'll read it. The Trump digital campaign used the exact same digital marketing strategies that are used every day by corporate America. This is from the Brad Pascale, the digital director for the Trump presidential campaign. So basically what the industry itself is saying, and if you look at their websites, we use exactly the same techniques in uh, getting uh, to get you to vote as we do in getting you to buy soap powder or washing machines or go to a certain club. So let's start our discussion. Uh, Michael, can I start with you um, and, and put a general question? How exactly how personal data is used in political campaigns? And uh, why have you started your investigation in the UK? Right, so there will be no spoiler alerts this morning. Why is the question that the uh, Commissioner for Information and Privacy in the United Kingdom has uh, set out to examine through an investigation, uh, and I am assisting in that investigation. My day job is a Deputy Commissioner in British Columbia. I would previously worked with Elizabeth Denham in British Columbia and uh, she has come, and I'm grateful to, for the opportunity to work with her uh, wonderful staff. First of all, uh, congratulations for being here this morning. Uh, somehow we drew the short straw, probably the most important panel of the conference uh, at 8.45 in the morning, but that's uh, 
be that as it may. Um, so the answer to the question, can democracy survive, the, the uh, question of this panel, and, and uh, we as regulators, of course, are impartial, and uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to give you a clear answer to that or able to give you an answer to that question. What I uh, want to just talk a little bit about uh, what the investigation involves, but begin by saying uh, there are many constructs of democracy, but I think surely one of them is a dialogue that occurs between the voter and political parties. Uh, where voters get to examine the platform and the interests behind political parties, get to understand that. Uh, the parties, on, uh, for their part, get to understand the voters and their needs and concerns, and then uh, a, cam a campaign uh, ensues. Somewhere along the line, uh, there seems to have been, there is an imbalance now in this relationship, and uh, an asymmetrical relationship where uh, it, it would appear that political parties and campaigns know an awful lot more about the voters than the other way around. That is not clear to voters, that is not clear to citizens, and it's probably the key reason why Commissioner Denham uh, determined that she wanted to pull the curtain back to help citizens understand w what is going on behind the scenes, how political parties are you collecting and using data uh, about, about them. Now, if you think about the evolution of this, not long ago, we're probably talking even 30 years ago, uh, the old-fashioned method in most Western industrial democracies, uh, political parties went door-to-door -door gathering information about you, about your neighbors, uh, talking about issues, maybe changed a little bit in the 80s with the advent of computer, and I should say, collected on pieces of paper, and God knows what happened to those pieces of paper when, uh, when an election was done. But I think it's fair to say there probably wasn't a lot of accumulation of data about you as citizens began to change a little bit in the 80s with the advent of computers, uh, databases, uh, where now you could record information about voters. Uh, it was a big deal back in those days to have a mail merge where you could link your name with an address. That was considered a big, uh, uh, a big deal. But uh, I should say, overlying all of that, overlying all of those conversations that are going on, is a campaign about issues generally fought in the public domain, in the public forum. Uh, major newspapers would be discussing issues, television stations, and there sometimes was only two or three of them. Uh, there was sort of a commonality of forum where these discussions would be happening. And so anybody going door to door would be hearing that back and forth. There would be these, uh, these uh, issues being discussed and debated uh, widely in the public. Things begin to change really in, in most recent times. The advent of big data. So now um, in many countries, many states, many provinces, uh, you have uh, the electoral uh, role is actually in an electronic format. Uh, and what happens is parties begin to link uh, your names and addresses with all kinds of other data. Stuff they may collect about you at your doorstep, but increasingly parties, and depending on your jurisdiction and what the privacy rules are, connecting that with um, big data brokers. So, uh, and people in this room will know some of the, the big players, so parties will link, uh, will link that information. Layered on top of that now, we have, um, we have ways to reach voters that simply did not exist even five or six or seven years ago in the way that they do now. And platforms, and I'm specifically talking about Facebook, that not only uh, many, many people, I think, I don't know what the stat is in the UK, about 80% of the population here is on Facebook, not only can they reach you through Facebook, Facebook knows uh, so much about you and knows your interests. Suddenly the whole notion of, I would describe it as transactional campaigning, no longer that campaign in the common arena, the common forum, mm -hmm. the message can be brought directly to you and your computer in home in a, in a uh, tailored way, algorithms and so forth that are able to uh, test all kinds of mes messages at an individual level. Um, the, the playing field, uh, I think, has changed. Uh, Paul mentioned uh, an additional factor on this. So uh, some would say the old style of campaigning was about uh, demographics, uh, how much you make, uh, uh, what your age or sex and so forth, and appeals would be made to you on that basis. You saw a little clip of a, of a, from Alexander Nix uh, who would say that's very old school. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the in vogue now is to understand your psychological profile so that the messages that they make can be uh, brought to right to your computer screen and, and uh, play on and play to uh, the psychological profile uh, of you as a voter. Uh, whether any of that is possible or not, uh, I'm, not uh, I'm not sure, I'm not uh, 
capable of giving a psychological answer to that question. But what we are looking at in the investigation in the United Kingdom is to try and pull back some of the details around some of the things I've just described in a way that I think citizens and voters will, uh, will understand. The Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Denham has described it as probably the most complex investigation uh, she has ever undertaken. Uh, as somebody who is well involved in it, I completely attest to that. Uh, we are talking to all the major political parties, we're talking to big data, we're talking to the social media platforms, uh, we are talking to the players that were involved in the referendum in the United Kingdom because that story in itself generated a lot of uh, concern and interest around how data is used in an electoral format. Um, all of that uh, obviously takes time. We have an outstanding team at the Information Commissioner's Office in the United Kingdom um, and uh, bringing to bear uh, uh, all of the tools that we have in our regulatory toolbox to try and get some of the, uh, get some of the answers to those questions that will help uh, citizens. So uh, it, is a, it is a challenge and uh, uh, look, uh, look forward to continuing to do work on this and I think the idea to report out probably sometime in the spring. So. Thank you very much for this, uh, Michael. Very, very interesting. Can I just ask a question which I know you will not answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In your early findings, do you think this kind of big data influence had, a, had any impact on the results in the Brexit referendum? Uh, so, uh, to come back to your uh, answering of your own question, uh, I'm not in a position to really talk about the findings uh, or, or the evidence that we've gathered at this point in the investigation. So, um, not being coy, that's just, uh, that's just uh, the way it is. Well, we, we look forward to the results, obviously. Uh, Jeff, can I pass the, the uh, word to you? Can you uh, tell us a little bit of your research into the... Trump campaign in the US? Uh, first, uh, this is a, a, a panel sponsored by my organization and the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, and it wouldn't have happened as, as well and uh, as far-reaching without the work of Anna Thiebaud. So I want to thank Anna. Okay, that's it. So look, Brad Perscow said it, in my view, right. What the Trump campaign did was simply use the tools at hand, right? And I want to make kind of three quick points in the five minutes I have. The failure to regulate the internet and the digital media and marketplace, principally by the United States, right, um, has created a global commercial surveillance apparatus, you know, with powerful tentacles in many ways, some of which uh, uh, Nick's uh, re referred to. Google and, and Facebook and the others, in the 90s it was AOL, prevented the U.S. government from enacting any kind of data protection legislation. My group, was the gr we, we, the my group was responsible for the only U.S. commercial data privacy law that the U.S. has, and that's children. Once you turn 13 in the United States, you really have no longer any privacy rights, and they never really wanted to look at the business model, whether it was Obama, uh, Clinton, and certainly Bush's, and certainly Trump's. Therefore, this system that, 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 that now plays a role in deciding who we elect is a global system found in literally every country, every nation. And if you go and look with, to go to Think With Google, which is their website for marketers, and just look at your region and just look at your country, you will see the same sorts of techniques. So I've been tracking the uh, role of digital media in the election somewhat for many, many years, but we principally work on financial marketing and health marketing and marketing to children. Um, but what was so striking in 2016 was that all, of, because of the failure to regulate the digital marketplace, what's the difference between 2012 and 2016 is a host of very powerful applications developed, you know, you know fueled by, by big data and our mobile connect, and our mobile and social connectivity that was able to do much more powerful things to people was able to track your location. It was able to get information about you in far-reaching ways through 
data marketing uh, clouds. It was able to take advantage of data management platforms that allow companies to manage your identity in, in their own terms. It was able to collect all of the information across all of your screens so they can do cross-device targeting to a single individual and much, much more. A whole set of new tools that now play a fundamental role in our everyday lives and the lives of our democracies and other non-democracies is basically been unleashed. In 2016, parties from the left, and I voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary, <laughs> parties from the left and certainly Trump used all these tools. That programmatic advertising, mobile marketing, cross-device targeting, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Google and Facebook expanded their uh, uh, advertising and marketing services in the political sphere. To them, I don't know if you know the term vertical, right? you sell advertising vertically, you sell health advertising, you sell financial advertising, you sell junk food advertising. Facebook and Google expanded their vertical political advertising business. And one thing that they say, if you haven't gone on and looked uh, 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 on Facebook, Facebook for Business, for example, if you look at Facebook for Business, which is the site they have for advertisers, and look at the political case studies, look at, uh, I think, with Google for their political case studies, and just look generally what the industry reports. They claim, of course, it has an effect. It has an effect on what you buy, on who you vote for, on who you think you are, et cetera. By the way, I should add that neuromarketing and a whole bunch of psycho-emotional applications also has, 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 has grown unconstrained and is part of all this, as, 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 as Nick said. And, and, the, and the companies refuse to adopt any kind of safeguards for their services. So pr anybody, in fact, could use that programmatic advertising system to target individuals in real time, which is why the Russians and others found it so easy uh, to, to do so. But my main concern is how the most powerful special interests are able now to use the system to influence uh, 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 camp campaigns. Um, and, and of course, all this, uh, with including algorithms, are done uh, in a non-disclosed way. They're totally unaccountable. Left unchecked, I think, my, my final point, left unchecked, despite promises that, fa I know Facebook said this week they're gonna follow the GDPR, et, et cetera, et cetera. I frankly think that you have to challenge that. If we're gonna have a serious uh, this debate about how this system operates to elect officials and, dis and develop our political agenda in countries and the, and, and the world, we must look into this system that's been created, that's being used in this way. I frankly do not believe that Facebook and Google and any of the rest both you know, uh, transnational companies like WPP, which has the world's largest database of uh, actionable profiles. If you go to Zaxis, X-A-X-I-S, and look at Zaxis politics, you will see they claim they have profiles on tens of millions of people that they can target them right away. The business model they have created does not allow, I think, compliance with the GDPR, what I hope will be the compliance with the GDPR. So unless you, we begin to check this system, certainly in the political area, I think this has, has threatens to erode our democratic institutions, our, our ability to govern, and frankly uh, serves the interests of the most powerful who may not in fact have the interests of the public interest at heart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, yes, you may clap, you are allowed. Those are my cousins over there. Thank you. <laughs> um, Suhi, you are the academic amongst us. You've done some serious research into bias on search engines and Facebook. Tell us your view on this, if you can in five minutes, but we'll continue the discussion. Yes, thanks, Anna. So um, as Anna already mentioned, I've looked at how people are looking, consuming news and information on social media and web platforms. Um, the part that I'd like to focus on today is the, is the work that we've done on understanding how political biases um, get incorporated into search results and what impact that has. So um, in a computer science venue, I would start by saying, hey, you know, today search engines, both on the web and on social media, are impacting what people are seeing. But clearly here, I don't need to make that point. We, we kind of know that. So the, the question is, what kind of impact? So there are a number of field studies that have been done that have shown that not only do users see the higher ranked search results a lot more, but they also trust it. So they have an inherent trust in the search rankings. They don't question why this result came up at this point. One particularly interesting study that was done by Epstein and Robertson, um, which was published in PNAS in 2015, 
I'd like to just point out some of the troubling findings that they had uh, from that study. So what they did was they conducted some um, experiments to determine if biased search rankings may actually sway elections by altering the preferences of undecided voters. So the findings that I find really troubling are that they found that by manipulating these search rankings, they were able to change the preferences of undecided voters by 20% or more. And this shift was even higher for certain demographic groups. So for instance, based on party affiliations and income levels. And this is where the, the profiling and micro-targeting comes in. So what that means is that in a closely contested elections, which let's admit are most of the elections around the world these days, the bias in the search results can have a big impact on the final results. And the worst part is that they found that most of the people who were part of their studies did not detect that the search rankings had been biased. So they were not even questioning whether what they're seeing is biased in certain way or the other. So these studies showed that the bias search, search results can potentially influence voter pr preferences. And now the big question that still remained to be answered was whether the search results in practice, right now deployed on the web platforms, whether they were doing some sort of manipulation, and if yes, who was, who was responsible for it? And this is the question that we tried to go after by performing some empirical studies to quantify the search bias for political searches related to the 2016 US presidential primaries, both for Twitter social media search as well as the Google web search. And I'd like to briefly point out some of the findings from our studies. So when we looked at the Twitter search results, we found that the bias in the search results that are shown to the users at the end is not only ori originating from the ranking system that Twitter has put in, but is also dependent on the input data that is given to the ranking system. So you might be wondering, what do, what do I mean by input data? So if I put it very simply, the, the input data is just the tweets that contain the query that you're interested in searching for. So what that means is that not only the Twitter's ranking algorithm is determining what you're seeing at the end, but also what the Twitter users are posting about that particular keyword that you're interested in is having an impact. So if there are agencies who have the power to create multiple accounts and set an agenda on the social media sites, that would also have an impact on what you end up seeing in, the, in terms of bias of the search results at the end. Um, next, we compared the relative biases for these political queries on Twitter social media search, which is sort of like a newer form of searching for people, with what people were used to doing even if, like five, ten years ago, which was to go on Google to search. Our comparison revealed that the bias for political candidates was a lot more favorable on the web search results. And the main, main reason is not because Google was trying to help them out, but because people have greater control over what is shown about them on the web search than they do on social media, where it's, it's sort of like more democratic in a sense that what other people are saying about you also determines what's shown about you. So on web search, they could just create their own home pages, their party's home pages, their social media profile links, and these would be the ones which would come up in the top and determine what people end up reading about them. So both of these findings have certain um, very fundamental things that we need to start thinking about. The first thing is that the different search systems not only you know, exhibit bias, but the biases are different for each of them. And earlier when we were trying to decide between, hey, should I go to Fox News to get my news or should I go to <coughs> CNN, I kind of had an idea of what the biases, inherent biases of these different sources were. Unfortunately, not only do people not think about biases when they talk about algorithmic channels like search or recommendations, they also don't have an idea of how their biases might be differing. And this is one thing that we definitely need to work upon and bring awareness about. Um, so having established the existence of search bias, the next big question was how do we actually tackle it? And that's still an open question. There are some technical options. That's for instance, we could design bias-aware search ranking systems, which also take into account the political bias of the search results that are being shown. Or we could make the biases transparent to the users on the user interfaces. 
Um, even though in our studies we did not find any systemic bias uh, that was being introduced by Twitter or Google, and by systemic I mean that um, they were not bringing up one party's perspective more over the others in a consistent way, or polarizing the results in a consistent way by adding democratic uh, bias to the democratic candidates and event queries and the Republican bias to the Republican ones. But the fact that there is no evidence for search engines having meddled with the search results so far. No, sorry, Julie, we have to. Yeah, uh, this is the final question that I want to leave you with. The fact that we've not fi found any evidence so far does not mean that it's good enough to just keep sitting and keep our fingers crossed, right? Um, so I feel that going forward, uh, we need to really work together from different disciplines to not only develop technical solutions, but also work with people from policy and law to come up and establish guidelines and enforce regulations and come up with systems which, which we can use to audit whether these are being done or not. And I think this is a great venue to question, you know, address questions like this. Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting, and I think it will generate a whole discussion. You know, we need to continue that with the audience as well. Um, I give the final five minutes to our colleague Irina Vasiliou from, the, from DG Justice who will tell us about European legal and policy aspects, please. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everybody. Um, indeed, thinking of the or reply to today's questions and just picking up of the, some of the words that were just said today, uh, trust, access, right of access, enforce regulation, uh, big data, and how we analyze it. I would posit that data protection regulation is not the answer for all but it is a key element. And why? It ensures in its own right checks and balances in a democracy. It also is an embodiment of how we address necessity and proportionality. Also, it's an element of empowering individuals and of taking and keeping actors, economic, public actors, accountable and responsible for what they do. So I think this is the first answer that I would give, yes, data protection legislation is an element that can enable at least some of the elements that ensure fair elections. It is not the answer for all. I will just maybe stop and just uh, highlight some of the elements that I think it's are important in the EU, from the EU data protection legislation that can impact and that have to be taken into account in, in the context of political campaigning. First of all, what we are talking is the legislation which covers different sets. It goes from commercial data, from health sector, financial, to including uh, processing in the public sector and by political campaigns. That means that it has to apply and the principles apply to everything. First of all, we have to be sure that what data are collected are accurate, that I have a clear purpose when I'm asking the data and that I do not usefully consider that data have to be gathered for a multiplicity of purposes that I will inform the individual at the end of the line at a very later stage in the process. That is one element. Usually data relating to political beliefs are sensitive data. And if you look at the definition today, data revealing, it goes even deeper. So all data, even nonsensitive data to start with, which reveal political beliefs have to be considered as sensitive data. What does it come in the European Union legal system by that classification, sensitive. It means that there are stricter rules on processing and a very limited one. That means that I can only process either if I have the explicit consent of somebody, if I am a public, a non-profit organization in the political system and I'm processing it for my own purposes, for my member, ex members, or if I have laws, union laws, or more particularly member state laws, which regulate such situations for uh, political campaigns and electoral activities. But very important, these laws have to ensure appropriate safeguard, have to be proportionate. And in the communication that the Commission issued yes yesterday in the next steps and what are the steps necessary that we and other actors have taken in order to ensure that the data protection regulation, the reform is a success, we also cautioned about all the laws at the member state level which need to be in compliance with the GDPR, any of them. Uh, regarding how they comply, both the CSIX and the one that they adopt, the GDPR. And that is a key element if this regulation has 
to have a success and to be actual reality. Another element which is very important is not only on what legal basis I can process data, but also what are my rights. And this is a key element which I was speaking before, empowerment. I need to be informed. I need to know in a transparent way what happens with my data. It might seem as a standard rule, but especially in a climate like the one of big data, where we could say, no, but it's just big data, it's just statistics, I'm not using it. No, we have to make a difference. If I still have personal data, I will have to make the rules apply and I will have to inform, I will have to be transparent, including in situations of profiling. And for profiling, you might know that also the working party has done a tremendous work in providing guidelines on profiling and automatic decision making, which will be uh, finalized very soon and which give a very good overview of what are the steps and the differences between profiling and automatic decision making and what are the implications of these rules. And I think this is key again to ensure that people actually know, especially in a climate where trust is very important, what happens with their data. Also maybe a last element, because I'm more than happy to take questions uh, later on, is on the restriction of rights. Of course rights can be restricted, the right of information, the right uh, of access, but these again have to be justified either by union law or by member state level in a very thorough way in order so that we still have um, real rights. Finally, the responsibilities of those processing data. Uh, the regulation, at least the EU one, enforces the obligations imposed on those processing data. They have to keep them secure. They have to be able to show that they were compliant. And that is a very big shift from what we had um, in 20 years ago. But I would end on the continuity. What you see as data protection rules exist for 20 years. They are very valid democratic rules which ensures the how not the what, you can, depending on the purposes, but the how. How do I do to make it compliant? And I think it's a very key legislation to ensure empowerment of individuals, democracy, and responsibility of, of operators at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul, you want to say something? Thank you. Yes, I, I want to add a little bit on what several of the panelists have said. I want to make it very concrete in this specific example, actually. So what, as I was working with journalists, and maybe the, the regulator next to me might want to listen, um, I, was, I was looking at what information was publicly available about, about what Cambridge Analytica was doing. So most of it here is not new in the context of a US election. But if you tell people that there are, that's, that's a schema of the actual database of Cambridge Analytica. It's extracted from a meetup where one of their early engineers was talking about their work. So he posted these slides online, and you, if you go on SlideShare, you can download the slides. So they're not only keeping v voter data and whether the voter attended an event, which election, etc., in what county the person is, but they also have the family ID of that person with information about the whole family. Okay, so if you start thinking about what effect that might have, it means that they can target families where there might be a, re a Republican and a Democrat on the other side. And they can target those families differently from other families that are more homogeneous. So they can start manipulating that little bubble in a certain way, right? So here it's a bubble we know, it's a family, it fits a classic pattern of you know, this little cocoon. But they can also create new, new bubbles online however they want according to different interests and start manipulating this. How would they manipulate it? So this is another, another uh, element that I found by looking at <coughs> videos that were filmed by Sky News. Um, and this is just a shot, you know, between two shots of an employee from Cambridge Analytica looking at a research paper. So if you try to find some words and then search on Google Scholar, you can actually find the actual paper she was reading. It's this exact paper, you compare it, it's, it's that one. And you look at the content of the paper and it's all about the need for cognition, quote unquote, and how to measure it, how to use it. Now the need for cognition is a measure of how, how uh, fact-based people are when they make decisions, basically. How much they think about decisions they're making or how impulsive they are. So if you go back to the family example, they can try to measure not only whether people have the same political opinion or not, but how emotional they are about it. 
So they can start trying to target families that have different opinions, where the debate is gonna be heated and emotional, mm -hmm. or the debate is gonna be to be much more reasoned. And basically have different ads for each of those groups. Just to give you an idea of how this whole thing can be influenced based Paul on concrete facts. Paul, you are frightening me. Um, Which is what they do when they sell, okay. uh, sell us junk food and others. They target right. the families and in, in members of the families individually. I, I just want to uh, bring the audience in now. I've, yeah. got, I've got a lot of detailed questions myself, but I'm aware you've all been sitting here and absorbing this information. Um, I've got, we've got a spare microphone here. That, uh, no, this one, hand one. So uh, who wants to start with any questions? Right, there's several hands up. We've got Kasha here, then we've got, yeah, one, two, three, four people. Uh, yeah, first is this lady here. Are you a lady? <laughs> I can be today. Uh, thank you very much, Katarzyna Szemilewicz, Panopticon Foundation. Thank you for doing this this morning. Uh, two observations. Um, one, mm, I, I hate to be uh, not in agreement with your points on the power of data protection as a civil advocate on this myself, but I'm la much less optimistic, in fact, to what extent we can use our rights against those companies. And uh, s simply practically speaking, if we go to, to Facebook and if we try to ac ac exercise our access right today, we will not find any of this. Uh, so, of course, I can imagine and I can even promise we will try to do court cases on this and try to uh, push them to reveal um, those hidden layers of, of profiling that we don't have access to as users. But that leads me to the second observation and, and actually a question to, to, to the panel. Uh, what should be our angle in trying to get knowledge about those political profiles uh, in Europe especially? Uh, in the US, I understand that there are very many databases that uh, people at Facebook and uh, people cooperating with, with, with Trump can, can use and, and combine because they, you know, the, the market for data is much more developed. In Europe, officially, we don't have this market. Uh, sensitive profiling uh, on political grounds, it's illegal. Uh, and yet Facebook is offering its services in Germany, for example, in the context of elections. And yet if you go to Facebook uh, website for advertisers, you will not find anything close to this as if it didn't exist. So how to approach this problem? With whom should we be, uh, not talking, but to whom should we direct our uh, access requests? Where should we dig for those profiles if they are officially non-existing at all uh, in companies like Facebook, especially in Europe? I'm, I'm really confused about the tactic we should apply here. Very good question. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, comments and questions from all four of you, and then I'll bring it back to the panel. So you were next, yes? No? Ta Sorry, can you tell your name? Because I yes. don't know your um, names. I'm Ivan Sekev, Central e European University. Um, uh, we used to say that big data is about what and not about why. But now it seems that the people using big data are getting more and more interested uh, about why. Or do you think that it's, it's still about the... Um, about the correlations or about the results, and they are not interested at all uh, why it is happening. So Another good question. There, were, uh, there was that gentleman at the back and then you at the front. Oh, you? Okay, you go first. Um, Olivia Tambou uh, was very interesting for uh, discussion on the panel. I think uh, as a citizen uh, it's also very important to have some key element of the debate. Um, and as a European I am also very concerned about uh, the Brexit uh, influence of uh, uh, those uh, things. My question is, um, is it possible to think uh, more something more than the GDPR, because uh, as uh, you mentioned, I am not so optimistic about the effectivity of the GDPR on such a, a big data. Um, uh, firms, um, where maybe uh, something about the statute or something can who can regulate data uh, brokers because uh, we are speaking about that. I know that uh, uh, there were some uh, ideas in France and maybe in United States. So how can we 
regulate the data broker because we have no transparency about what they really do. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last mm -hmm. comment question. Um, hang on. The, yes, uh, the gentleman with the glasses at the back. And then I'll <coughs> pass to the panel. Uh, Nicholas Martin from Fraunhofer Easy in Karlsruhe. This is a bit of a heretical question, but if big data micro-targeting is so powerful, why are we apparently seeing so little effect? So if you think of um, both the Brexit vote and the Trump-Clinton uh, vote, these were really very narrow votes or very narrow results. Um, and let's remember Clinton actually won, as that's normally understood. Um, both elections took place against the backdrop of large, well-established right-wing media noise machines, Fox in the US, the Murdoch Papers, the Telegraph, the Mail in the UK, and um, public broadcasters or liberal outlets like BBC or, or um, the New York Times, which were either arguably cowed in their coverage, if you think of the Brexit BBC coverage, or uh, distracted with pseudo topics like emails. So given that, what is actually still here that, uh, that is unexplained about these electoral outcomes that we would need uh, big data micro-targeting maybe to explain? And if there is so little effect of that, why is that? Is that perhaps because everyone is doing it? So the, uh, the sort of all sides, so the sum effect kind of goes to zero? Okay, thank you very much. Four excellent questions. Um, uh, one about the effectiveness of the law, in fact, two about the effectiveness on the law. One about um, more transparency. And finally, the devil's advocate question, what about all the other influences and, and the official media and so on? Who would like to start? things just respond look at you know it, to our colleague uh, from Budapest I mean you know the the commercial sector right um, you know the word that they use at Google and Facebook and they all, all the others use is quote actionability all of these techniques right the, the marketing applications and the and the data applications all fuse increasingly in real time cross device to change you so they're less interested right in 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 the in the in the why they they know exactly what they want to do you're going to buy this soap you're going to vote for this person you're going to think about this way so that's that's where the focus I is and now it's it been and this is my answer to you to her, the heretical question they're all using this. They're using this in financial services and health services and political campaigns. And it's about to get stronger, you know, because they've invested very heavily, Google and Facebook and others, in artificial intelligence to make decisions, to manage individual and, and group behavior. The Internet of Things, this cross-device world, th it's very clear the direction the system has gone. It's only going to become much more powerful, right? And so this is the time to look at it and figure out what is prudent uh, uh, regulation and, 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 and protection. And although it would be great to go beyond the GDPR, I mean, I think it's a, good, it's a very good <coughs> place to start because if you look at Facebook's data partners, okay. Oracle Marketing Cloud, Axiom, they're all integrated into the system today. Irina. Sorry, I guess I took too long. Um, maybe to Kasia on, on, the, on the optimism and uh, um, as a commission, we prefer to be optimist, maybe naive sometimes, but optimistic nevertheless. On the, apart from the joke, I think what is key, at least from my perspective, and we have a regulator on the panel and I see colleagues in the, in the um, audience as well, is that I think the situation is still different or will be different in May compared to now. Maybe not exponentially different, but still different. Why? Because there are things which have to be clearer. I have to inform if I have to do further processing because maybe my initial processing would not have contained that, but I have to inform about further processing. I have to know and now I have to be held accountable to what type of data do you collect to have a strict purpose limitation, which was there before. And now there are also all the powers that the data protection authorities have 
to enforce. And yes, the right of access. That is, at least in data protection terms, the only action that I know, apart from the option uh, apparent in Article 80 on the action by groups, which can act on behalf. But I think there are still elements which can help. On, on the regulator of um, other data brokers, if those data brokers still use personal data, again, I think instead of creating something new, let's put it like that, if it is about personal data, there are regulators which have now uniform powers. So they should be the ones that should also deal with this part. That maybe is not enough, maybe that is indeed something to further reform. Okay, so I think Paul wants to say something. Michael, you want to? Um, so to a few points. In terms of what political parties know about you as an individual, most jurisdictions in Europe uh, and in, in North America, well, at least in Canada, you can ask the parties and they're obligated uh, to tell you uh, what information they have about you. And, and in most Western democracies now, Parties actually pretty much have a number or rating assigned to each citizen in terms of their mm -hmm. uh, voter preferences or predilections uh, to try and make uh, uh, predictions about you and how they should essentially handle you in elections. So, and the ICO uh, does receive, uh, uh, actually has received numerous requests, uh, appeals to, uh, that have been made to uh, political bodies uh, asking for that information. And the bodies themselves actually answer uh, uh, numbers of questions of those kinds of inquiries. Um, in terms of um, the political party's use of data, I mean, one of the questions we will be looking at answering is what is the basis for the parties collecting this information in the first instance? Uh, certainly one of the uh, uh, basis in the United Kingdom is that it's necessary, potentially necessary for a legitimate interest. The question is what is their interest in collecting all that data? Is it legitimate? And when we say is it necessary, is it proportional? Mm -hmm. Do they need all of that vast data of information in order to have that dialogue with you that, uh, as, a, as a citizen that uh, I've talked about? Uh, and is it, and, and it's an interesting question, uh, both maybe a philosophical, ethical, potentially legal question. Uh, shopping for a bar of soap, is that the same as shopping for your vote? I mean, are we talking about different rules? Do we need to think about things differently when we're talking about uh, democracy? The last point on the rules and the GDPR, I think people should be aware of, and uh, uh, the, the really excellent comments by Irina, but I just, I do want to add a cautionary note, and that is that to date, and I, I'm sorry to bore you with the wording, but recital 56 is actually fairly important in this respect. Uh, where in the course of elect, uh, this is what political uh, mm -hmm. politicians across Europe have agreed to, shockingly, where in the course of electoral activities, the operation of the democratic system in a member state requires the political parties compile personal data on people's political opinions, the processing of such data may be permitted for reasons of public interest, provided that appropriate safeguards are established. So often politicians uh, disagree about uh, considerable uh, numbers of issues, but on collection of your data, I think this is one where they seem to be of, uh, of a similar uh, opinion. In the United Kingdom, just so you know, uh, Sensitive data, uh, y you need explicit consent to collect sensitive data. Interestingly, pursuant, and there was a, 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 a recital that was in the Directive 95 as well, uh, the, the DPA in the United Kingdom actually takes that sensitive data attachment to political opinion, well, takes it out of the sensitive data category in the United Kingdom and allows parties to collect that information so long as it does not cause, I think the wording is substantial harm to the individual. It's I incidentally, it's also in the new data protection bill and uh, we have protested a lot but to I that effect. I, I think it's UK parties, which is gonna be interesting in the case of the US election using a British yeah. company to process the data. So I think it's UK parties that the exception is written about. Paul, you wanted to, to say something too. Yes, yeah. about the law. The qu I think the question with the access right of Kasia was specifically in relation to Facebook. So first of all, where should you address? Well, in... Yeah. Yeah, so in yeah. May, access rights are free. So my answer is everywhere. Just do it everywhere, because if you do it everywhere, you will expose the different legal mechanism or legal interpretations that they're using that are sometimes contradictory. Now, the, the real, my opinion is that you have to do it to the political parties for all the data that they are controller of and for which Facebook is processor. 
So you have to go to the political parties and force them to ask Facebook for this data. Now, if they don't do it, then you go to Facebook and say, look, in your contractual obligations to the parties and to other advertisers, you have that they have to respect the rights. And those rules they have because of European data protection law. So now you say to Facebook, look, you have some actors on your platform that are not respecting local laws. You have to kick them off. So I've tried to do that, actually, with the French election, where I did uh, access requests to all the big players in the election after signing up to their mailing list, liking their pages, all of that. And I did access requests to all of them. Of course, I didn't get any response, any substantial response from any of them. But then I went to Facebook saying, look, what are you going to do? And so that's where now I'm pushing that back to Ireland, where I'm not getting any support. But if you know this was more organized and everything, it can push m more towards some form of platform regulation around data protection, which I know is a way that regulators really like to, to go about. If you look at content, for instance, the responsibility for hate speech is on Facebook, not really on the person uploading, or at least you know, you have to play with all this, but I think there is a strategy there. Juhi, you wanted a few comments, and then Irina, you wanted a few, and then I'll bring it back to the audience. Yeah, so I'd like to go back to the question that you asked about the, are we still concerned about the what and not the why? Um, it's just that the what has expanded a lot. So um, the example that Paul was showing, there is, and even the video that we saw in the beginning, there is a lot more kind of data that people have been able to con get. And the why, they are turning towards the academics to answer. So there is a lot of research on um, how different factors, like behavioral factors, affect your decision making. And this has been studied. It's just that there was no access to this kind of data, but it is now. So the, they are really interested in the how and the what. The why is already being answered by the academics, unfortunately. Um, and how do we, what do we do about it is, I'm not sure. I don't know, I don't have a good answer. Do we stop research? Of course not. But how do we make sure that it's not used in a negative way? Yeah. In 30 seconds, maybe to react uh, on, on two points of Michael and Paul. Uh, on, on Michael, I, I, I agree that the recital on, uh, political, uh, on political parties uh, and compiling political opinions is there. It's 56 now, it was for 20 years the 36th recital. So probably the politicians are the same since the last 20 years. But for me, that is of no, in the sense, that law has to obey all the provisions of the GDPR. And for me, the key is on the appropriate safeguards. I will always have to underscore that and and derive that from, is it necessary, is it proportionate, do I have the appropriate safeguards to do that? On Paul's uh, comment, indeed, but should you be informed correctly who is the controller, which is the first requirement of Article 13, you should not send access request urbi et orbe, but to the controller, which is supposed to reply adequately and to say, here is what I have processed according to the purposes for which you entitled me, or uh, I was required under law. So I think that is also the, the problem. We do not know, and the lack of right of information, appropriate right of information, is another element in the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more you wanted to make a comment? Uh, Thanks, Anna. Uh, Andrew Adams, Major University. Um, somewhat going back to the very first question we had, um, I think we're in danger. Yes, this is a privacy and data protection conference. We're in danger of missing the bigger picture, one of which is, and this goes back to the last comment we had as well, which is why Trump and Brexit are we blaming this for? Part of the issues here, in particular in the US and the UK, we've had very weak um, electoral uh, oversight. Um, in these particular areas. In the US, there is a problem that Facebook lobbied hard, particularly Facebook, also the other companies, but particularly Facebook lobbied very hard to get political ads on Facebook exempted from the rules that apply to radio, newspaper, and television. And that needs reversed. And the information commissioners, the data protection authorities, the uh, appropriate authorities in the US need to, to be dealing with this, and they need to be working together with the Electoral Commission people. In the UK, there are some very strict rules that were not applied during the Brexit referendum, and those apply both to uh, the UK 
um, organisations, there is you know a huge amount of evidence now that uh, at least one or maybe m multiple of the Leave campaigns were using Twitter bots. Now there are there are existing rules on the on the uh, Electrical Commission on Twitter accounts, very specific rules that a Twitter account has to have in its profile that it is an official account of an organisation. That was not the case. Those were not listed on there, and yet nothing has been done. Now, this is an area where the ICO doesn't have jurisdiction on this. It's not the ICO's job, it's the Electoral Commission's job, and they haven't been doing their job. But the ICO can be saying, and working with the Electoral Commission, saying this is an area of common interest, and this is something we need to push, particularly as the GDPR comes in, that in this particular area, it's not the Data Protection Authority's only job. It's they have to be working with the other uh, organisations to figure out how they're going to work together to, to uh, keep our fundamental right of autonomy. This is, this is what it comes down to. It's autonomy, which is related to privacy, but it's the autonomy and political autonomy, which is a core fundamental element of, of our democracy. And that's what we need to do. We need to get the Data Protection Commissioners and the Electoral Commissioners and get the common rules working on these. Um, I, that, that is a sort of very good comment. Thank you very much, because we, we also need to discuss about what other electoral rules in democracies complement what is happening here. Uh, we have broadcasting media and print media quite heavily regulated in terms of elections. What are we going to do about big data and online? And can that was your main point. Yeah, can I uh, just make one quick comment in, in respect to that? Uh, as we have done looking at our investigation, there are some issues that are obviously, and they've, uh, this is not saying anything out of school because it's been reported publicly around some of the financial issues. Those are issues that the ICO uh, doesn't deal with. It is the Electoral Commission. That said, uh, we have uh, had communication with the Commission throughout this proceeding and actually we're, we're attempting to put in place a memorandum of understanding uh, to be able to share information to, to serve the public better, to ensure that there's no overlap in, uh, in the work that we do. So your point is very well taken. But in the United States, we have a very weak uh, Federal Election Commission, right? And even though you're right, Facebook and the companies famously lobbied the Federal Election Commission to not implement the same kind of disclosure requirements that are required uh, uh, for, for television. I don't think disclosure alone in a digital context is really uh, m meaningful. It's the failure overall to I in the United States and, the, and the, uh, the fact that the companies have been able to capture all the administrations and the, and the policy making uh, process that has uh, uh, cre created an environment where they're able to do anything they want in all the spheres, and that's the U.S. problem. Necessary but not sufficient. I think. Yeah. To your point, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. It's, sorry, it's true that in up until March 2017, the ICO and the Electoral Commission were just two different verticals, not talking to each other essentially on those issues. And the big gap, the big s specific gap that there was is in understanding, having the same database in the back end, if you want, as collaboration between different sides of a campaign that are not supposed to collaborate. So typically in Brexit, you know, different groups have spending limits, but if their spending goes into a common uh, database of profiles, that's a collaboration. But the Electoral Commission didn't see that as a potential problem, or I, I don't know how to phrase it, but they were not looking at that. And what we need is good enforcement at the data protection level as a, data as, a, as a base layer for informed discussion and then informed enforcement of other um, interests that we want to preserve. Um, there was a, somebody want, yes, and cash her again afterwards, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I would like to ask, uh, what Can if... Can you uh, tell us your name, please? Uh, Gianmarco Gori from University of Florence. Thank you. What if providers would uh, comply with their transparency duties and people just don't care about the, the use of their data for these purposes? Don't we have another interest, a public interest, in regulating this, uh, this use of data? Thanks. So you are, you are essentially asking what if the public doesn't care about their data being used in that, that yeah, way? They're still being manipulated, so yeah. We have a public interest in doing the regulation. Okay, thank you. Kasha. Oh. 
Thank you. Very good point made that it should be societal interest, not only individual interest if we want to get any results. And just two more observations on the broader picture. One is that I have strong feeling that if we chase political parties, we will quickly learn that they are not responsible for those targetings. They have nothing to do maybe formally and practically and financially even with the actual campaigns, right? Because we are talking about Twitter, Facebook, soft tools, soft propaganda, which is difficult to be attributed to political party. We are not talking, I believe, about official marketing of a presidential uh, um, candidate, but about things like fake news or things like uh, other messages that might support the candidate but are not labeled with the candidate. So that's uh, an additional challenge with regard to access requests. And second practical problem, back to democracy, what do we do with players who play uh, really evil games, really dirty games? When I discussed that in Poland with people who do political marketing, they told me, okay, even if I, with my progressive, more liberal party, agree to talk to you about data protection, our opponents on the right will not. So if we comply, we actually give more advantage to those players who will not comply. Uh, what do you do? If you really care about, about democracy, it might be the case that we have to give up a little bit on the principles, not to support the, the really dangerous political sides, parties that will not respect those rules anyway. Okay, so this brings another important, two important elements in the discussion. A, the link with fake news and what is not generated by political parties. And secondly, this discussion started in the first place because of Trump and Brexit. Um, I, as I understand, the Macron campaign was also helped by um, a company that uh, deals in big data. Why are we talking about one side and not the other, um, which is another important question. Would we say the same things if a different result was in Brexit? So I, I just want a few comments to what Kasia said and then these bigger philosophical questions? So, as a regulator, the answer to your question is yes. Even had a treatment, you made reference to France. Uh, there was an issue in France where I think it was individuals were sign not even signing up to campaigns or indicating interest in campaigns, giving their emails, uh, I believe it was to Macron and others, who were using the Nation Builder platform. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. It's a, essentially a database for political parties. But what it does, uh, it has one feature which uh, was automatically enabled in France. Uh, which was that it would link your name uh, to your social media accounts. It would do that automatically for the parties to help them get a better understanding of you. Uh, the Canil shut that down. Once that was understood, in fact, that's what they were doing, that, that, uh, that, was, uh, that was shut down. Um, boy, it's a dark, dark uh, topic this morning, and, and uh, I, I really get the question about, will, do people even care about this? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but before we can even get to that question, people surely have to understand what is happening. This may be not news for people in this room, but I'm going to guess that for the vast majority of citizens, they have absolutely no clue as to how information is being collected about them. I suspect they would likely be surprised, and that's part <coughs> of what the commissioner in the UK has set out to do. Let's take the first step. Let's try and pull back the curtain to understand what it is uh, that parties are are collecting about you so that citizens at least can make that informed decision about whether they should care or not. And I think everybody in this room probably has an obligation to, to go out and help that process and to inform if you're part of civil society or otherwise to help inform the public so that in a democracy it is robust, people understand these things, can, can challenge authority if that's necessary or if it's perfectly adequate or fine, uh, that's also a decision that people can make. But first people have to know. Irina? Uh, yeah. Specifically on the CNIL's action, because I think there were two deficiencies in the action of the French regulator um, in, the, in the context of the French election. The first thing is, this was only revealed through a Le Monde article that came in March 2017, while they were caught actually in December 2016. So the CNIL didn't say publicly that a few candidates were using those techniques and had violated data protection law. That's one thing. Why didn't they? If part of the, the public interest is that the public is informed about the techniques that are being used. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is that when Le Monde reported uh, about this in March 2017 for the election that was taking place in June 2017, the reporter asked, so what's the consequence? They've been prevented from keeping using the tool, okay, but did this provide an advantage? Is this unfair, an unfair election now? And the CNIL said, well, we'll see. If the margin of between the third and the second candidate is too, too small, which is what's important in the first round in the primaries in France, then we'll refer it to the electoral judge, which I think is a catastrophe because it's saying basically we're going to hold elections, we're going to tell tens of millions of people to go vote, but we don't tell them that we still have to make some judgment call on whether the margin is too, sh too narrow. What's too narrow, right? I mean, this is, this is a catastrophe in okay. terms of action. Okay, we've got, we've got, hang on Jeff a second, yeah. we've got three minutes left, the bell has rung. Um, absolutely vital discussion, we haven't even covered the, the sort of surface of it. Can I have a one minute comment from each of you uh, to, to tell us what are the next steps, what do we need to do uh, for the future, whether it's reg more regulation, more information, uh, a combination of things, uh, what? Um, Should we start at the end? Or start with uh, the no, we'll start with uh, Michael. Well, I've got an immediate task on my plate. Uh, we've got to get this investigation <laughs> finished. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just conclude my remarks by responding to um, one of the members of the audience who was asking about uh, the rules of the road. And you know, if one is, there's a unilateral disarmament in a sense, if one party says we'll, we'll play by the rules or we'll play clean and others don't, that's a really good point. And I think one of the things that we are thinking about in this investigation, uh, and the commissioner I think said this to a parliamentary committee two days ago, was that perhaps what is required is a code of conduct with respect to the parties. The GDPR provides for codes of conduct that can be uh, binding. Um, that, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, it's a, it's, it's the political world is an interesting one. Uh, you know, we're about data, and, and, but I, I be, be it will be interesting to see what the, par the public's response is when we're able to hopefully pull back the curtain and whether something like a code that sets some basic ground rules by which everyone plays uh, is something that might be useful going forward. So uh, I appreciate very much the comments that have been made here today and as somebody working with the regulator, very, very helpful. So, so thank you for your input and questions. Just very briefly, by the way, the current issue of the Internet Policy Review, we have an article and there's a series of articles that goes into political micro-targeting. It's open access. I hope you look at it. It's an EU-based. Journal, I, the one thing I think is to implement the GDPR. You're not going to have data protection, privacy, digital marketing regulation in the United States. Right? These, the U.S. is going to continue to give these folks a free ride to expand their basic global business model, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans. It's true that for, you know, because Hillary lost, <coughs> the, de the Democrats that have been so pro-Google and Facebook and others are now cr increasingly criticizing it, and that's hopeful, but we're not going to see anything meaningful happen in the United States. That's why you have to implement the GDPR to its fullest extent. You have to look at all the data practices and you especially have to look at how the political parties and the political campaigns are using that data in elections and, and, and campaigns. Look, it's a, and it, is, it is a complex problem. It's a balancing act between fundamental rights, you know, our First Amendment, freedom of expression, and, and regulation, but you need to address this now and we need to force every global company, especially U.S. ones, to adopt in, in every country what they have to do in the EU. Okay, so I just have a small comment. I think, I think there has to be a cross-disciplinary approach. So a lot of the people who are developing these algorithms, you know, computer science scientists who are doing research, they're not aware of a lot of the regulations and policies that are in place. And I think it would be really great. There are already um, um, venues where people from the law background and computer science are coming together to talk about fairness and algorithmic transparency. And I think we need to have more and more of this. And I'm happy to be at this conference. I can get, take back some of the ideas that were discussed here, but uh, hopefully next year there are more. <laughs> I'll just second um, the, the previous comments and maybe to react on two points. People not caring, indeed, awareness. If you look at the Eurobarometer's 
80% of the people do not trust how their data are used online. Probably the same would happen <coughs> if somebody would go now and ask for election campaigns. But let's see, so awareness, one element. Enforcement, the second. Probably if you can get Jeff to speak like that in all conferences, that would also help um, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Paul, you have the last word. Well, the last word will be European focused. Um, with what Kasia is saying about the implementation of the GDPR in Poland, I think, um, that's kind of worrisome because I think we'll have the same debates in a couple years, but which reduced to member states. We'll have situations where, you know, there is an election in France that where the database of a political party was hosted in Poland. And the GDPR allowed that, but it turns out that if you host your database in Poland, you can do more political profiling. Or if you use some adequacy instrument, you have it in England, where more is allowed to be done. That's the case now, but with Canada and the UK, or with you know the, the US and the UK, all those transborder data flaws are being used to circumvent the law. And it's going to go back to the member state level. Well, on this optimistic note, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all the panels for your excellence and thank you to the audience for being here.